Our scripture tonight comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. I'll actually begin the reading at verse 1 of that chapter, but our focus tonight will be on verses 12 through 18 of Philippians chapter 2. And since I'm invited back next week, I'll also be uh, following up this sermon with uh, a second that kind of forms a series. That, that you, we start with some marching orders, what I call it, as it's reflected here in Philippians. And should you uh, re-extend an invitation to me, I have a couple of more sermons I might offer in this regard. But that's uh, at your invitation. In any case, uh, Philippians chapter 2, we start at verse 1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, Consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain or for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with all of you. So, to you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Thus far, a reading from God's holy word. May he bless that word to us. First thing I want to say about this passage is, when you come to books like Ephesians or Colossians or Philippians, those are letters Paul wrote to churches, but there's letters he wrote when he was imprisoned. It's a jailed Paul, a bound up Paul, a suffering for Jesus Paul. And yet he's full of exhortation. He's still given the freedom to write, even to receive visitors and the like. And he's given the right in this way to continue to bring the gospel. So a miserable thing, God's apostle put in prison. And yet uh, now he has time to sit down and write letters uh, by the inspiration of the spirit for our blessing too. And now when we come to this particular passage in chapter two, you find that he's quite concerned to urge us onward, forward, march into Christian living. This is one of his most positive letters of the ones he writes. It doesn't have near the kind of admonition you find in some of his other letters, but it does have exhortation onward, forward. This is not sit on our hands, it's not bask, I'm saved, good, now what? Well, now what? Live like it. 
How about that? And so he starts in chapter 2 there with all these little if clauses. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, and in the Greek language, that if clause isn't, oh, I don't know, it's an if clause meaning, and of course you have, it's that kind of if clause. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, and of course you do have encouragement, and if any comfort from his love, yes, I am, of course you're comforted from his love, and if any fellowship with his spirit, yes, that's why I pray and I, I worship because I have fellowship with it. Yes, 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 that. If any tenderness and compassion, have any? Should hope so. Well then, given that, okay, then this. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded talking to a church. I've never known anyone in the church to disagree with one another. I've never known anyone in the church to argue and have dispute. What a thing to imagine. <laughs> Come on. We all know how easy it is to disagree and to have spats with one another, and then it gets even more serious, and sometimes we've witnessed where it becomes a real bitterness or, you know, people start taking big sides in a church. Now, Paul is in prison, looking after churches where he has served and planted the gospel, writes this letter. And since you have all these blessings in Jesus, you're united to him, fellowship, spirit, be like-minded, agree, have your mind shaped by the gospel, have your mind shaped by God's word. Take an assessment of yourself, how you think about things. Don't do things out of selfish ambition. Don't do things because it puts you one up on others. Don't do things out of vain conceit. And all this stuff happens. Happens in a seminary, happens among ministers at classes, happens in consistory rooms happens at Bible studies, happens in all kinds of places. No, not that. Let's live out the gospel. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interest of others. Of course you need to take care of your own interests. But don't be all curled in on yourself and all you see is yourself and your problems. What about other people? Usually you discover that other people have some pretty tough stuff going on in their lives, and they could use prayers and help and love and friendship. And so he finally brings it down to Jesus to have the mind of Christ. And of course, we know that famous passage, he didn't count equality with God, something to be grasped. No, he became incarnate. We just celebrated that with Christmas. Almighty Son of God made flesh, humbled down into infancy, of a human being, and finally even the shameful death on a cross, but now exalted, as we saw in Revelation, the exalted reigning Christ, the name above every name, the name before whom all shall bow. Now, all of that leads up to what he wants to tell us, and this is where we really begin tonight with verse 12, given who Christ is and what he did, therefore as you've always obeyed in my presence, all the more now in my absence. You know, it's like parents who leave their kids home and when dad and mom are around, yep, yep, okay, yeah, yeah. And then when they're off and away, we'll play. You know. <laughs> and he's saying, no, 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 don't be like kids, naughty kids, no. Even if I'm away, the one who really has guardianship of you, who's your Lord, Master, Groom, King, Friend, all those things, is the Lord himself. So even in my absence, continue to do what? Work out your salvation, which I entitle here a salvation workout. Now, you can't tell, you know, life goes a lot of years but in my young years, 
teen years, 20s and so on, I was one of those fit kind of people. <laughs> I really cared about it too. I was even conceited about it. One of those fit, you know, V-shaped, muscular types. And what's wrong with you? You know, I was, like I said, I was conceited about it. And so God found a way to humble me <laughs> later. But anyway, a workout is part of building your body. And it's a good thing. How do you make yourself stronger? By pressing your body, by stressing it, not to injury, but forcing it to do, you know, to work hard, to breathe hard, to find fatigue in muscles. And then with rest, the muscles get a little stronger. And you, now our faith is like that too. You don't get stronger in faith by being put in a coma and coming back 10 years later, and now I'm strong. No. Now you're foggy, if anything, and your muscles are atrophied, and your memory's maybe not as clear as it should be. Now your, your, your body is made better by activity. Our faith is made better by working out the implications of what belonging to Jesus means. Why does God put me through this trial to make you stronger? That's why. Why do I endure this challenge? To keep you on your knees praying, believing, trusting, depending on him. To work out the salvation of Jesus in you all the more. And so the first thing we find with this salvation workout is we're to do so, to work this out in fear and trembling. Work out what it means to be saved in fear and trembling. Um, the, the idea of working out there is a word that's also used for working a mind so that when you work a mind, you're getting all the good ore out of it, or working even a field so that you work the field in such a way that you get a full harvest, so that when you're working out salvation for yourself, it's the fruits of Jesus' love and grace and mercy, that mind of Christ, that becoming humble, that working to be like-minded, all those different things we noted earlier, this starts to become evident. So that, yeah, when you work out something, you work out the implications of something. It's as simple as parenting. There are people who get converted later in life as adults, even as married people with children, and, and they become believers and now as they work out their salvation, they start discovering, oh, I need to treat my children differently. I need to nurture them differently. I need to protect them from certain things. I need to educate them differently. And this is why we have Christian schools and home schools and the like. I know parents who send their kids to public school, and I know some of them, even them, are very diligent. What are you learning? What's going on? What, you know? But the point is, is you're seeking to now, as a Christian parent, nurture your children in conformity with the gospel. This has been a long standing in different parts of the Christian tradition. Roman Catholics had had a great deal of concern for education. They've long understood, well, who's getting inside the minds of people and setting a direction. Various Lutheran traditions do this, and certainly our tradition, specifically the Dutch Reformed tradition, has a long history of concern for nurturing that which belongs to Jesus, and that's why they're baptized. Therefore, nurture them in the way that fits faith in Jesus. Not unbelief, not hostility, to, but works in tandem with. Is You're working out what salvation is educationally. And yeah, part of that is you're teaching your kids 
that you live before Christ, who's the cosmic Christ, the one through whom all things were made. Nothing that was made is not made through the word, through him. Which means the whole creation isn't some abstract cosmos, it's creation, it's God's, it belongs to him. He knows every star. He knows every, you know, the, the John Webb Welloscope, uh, telescope, excuse me, uh, is discovering galaxies by a, the way we used to count stars, they're counting galaxies. Wow. Wow. It's God's. Once again, is your God too small? No, he's not too small. Your conception of God, is that too small? Yeah, probably. Our conception of God is too small. The vast universe is mind-boggling, and it belongs to God. But it also means this created order and this very planet and on which he's placed us can elicit, we can elicit from it technology and commodities and items and food and clothing and, and you know, every invention God put there. So when you say, well, what's all that about? When you work out your salvation, you're working out living for Jesus in everything. What you don't do is, Jesus is my Sunday Lord. And then in, on Monday, I'll wait till Sunday again for him to be my Lord. No, he's your Lord everywhere, all the time. You're united to Christ by faith. You're never disunited. And so he takes you everywhere and he's with you everywhere you go. In your home, on your, in your kitchen table, in your bedroom, on the golf course, that trip to Mexico or whatever it is, you belong to Jesus. Everything belongs to him. And when we work out our salvation, we realize that all of life is lived before his face. It's a good thing. It's a glorious thing. So when I go to work, that's also a Christian calling before his face. And that means that children can think about what they're going to do when they grow up, whether they farm land or drive a truck or explore mathematics or athletics or engineering or they sell products or they fix mechanical things. All kinds of stuff, right? These are all what are honorable callings, dutiful, helping, service to others, bringing life forward. That's not dirty stuff. That's the stuff of life that God put there for us. And we offer it back to him. Working out your salvation before his face. Now we know that working out of salvation ends in glory, a new heaven and a new earth, a resurrected body, yes. And no mind has conceived, no ear has heard. Yes, all of that. But on the way to that, we also work out our salvation. On the way to glory, life lived now, here, in homes with people, at jobs. We work out our salvation. Now, why with fear and trembling? Because we're weak. Because we're prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. <laughs> because we need grace every day. Because we also get conceited and arrogant. Because we so easily become unlike-minded or competitive or do things out of pride and not or vain conceit or selfish ambition. Whether we're a mother in the home and a wife nurturing children as Christian women, husbands and fathers in the home, loving, respecting our wives, nurturing our children as Christian men, whether we own a business or we are someone's, uh, under someone's employ, we work out salvation in everything. And that takes a whole church, and it takes kind of the church growing through history, and it even takes what Christians are able, the freedoms and potential they're able to do to press the claims of Christ, say, on a civil political level, 
in one time and place. Other Christians in another time and place, given the kind of political crime, climate and so on, they can't do that. So it's not a one-size-fits-all. We prayed for the Supreme Court decisions upcoming. Because it matters to this land. It matters to Christians in this land. It, it matters to the future of our country. But there's Christians in other countries that don't even have the hope or privilege of a Supreme Court making wise decisions that protect freedoms and rights and protection of faith and all of that. So when we say work out our salvation, we're not saying it's the same everywhere for all believers, but you work it out as best you can where God has placed you. And he's placed us here in this land, in this time, with these blessings. Because all of life is sacred, all legitimate, and with fear and trembling because we all have feet of clay. In other words, when we become believers, and that's by grace, right? By the power of the Spirit, the mighty power of the gospel, the, 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 taking what's dead and making it alive, all of that great stuff. It's not like, oh, now you're fixed and you're fine and ta-ta, the Spirit can say, I don't need, I don't need to be with you anymore. <laughs> really? Just the opposite. I need God's presence all the time. I need the Spirit to indwell me, to convict me of sin, to show me the way, to enlighten me. I know more about myself at age 66 than I did at age 16 and at age 26 and 36 and 46 and 56. In other words, this journey of working out, this salvation workout, is also the spirit working out faith and discovery of faith and a discovery of where you're full of pride or not dependent or conceited and all kinds of things about us. All our blind spots. You don't discover those all at once. But through a journey of faith, through a salvation workout you do, you discover more and more. And that's why even an old saint who loves the Lord doesn't, as he grows or she grows in, in righteousness and obedience, doesn't congratulate themselves. They congratulate the Lord and praise him for a grace that's worked in their lives. Our faith withers, you know if God should separate himself from us. Our faith withers if we stop hearing the word and the gospel. It, it, it maybe doesn't get obliterated, but then we, you know, if you were put in a concentration camp, you have no Bible, now, now suddenly you're starting to recite confession and scripture and, and even sermons and all sorts of gospel things, you're trying to cling to word of God as you've imbibed it through the years. And you might even get with other believers and they know stuff. And now you're memorizing what they know and they what you know. There's Christians who testify of, of that. The point is, is you need the Bible. You need word of God. So whether we're young or old, we need the same thing. If I said, hey, just don't eat for the year 2024, well, you'll never see 2025. <laughs> your, 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 your body's going to atrophy and fail. Well, our faith won't necessarily fail without sermon and worship, but it will wobble and maybe become lazy and disobedient and sidetracked. Genuine faith, though, wants the word, seeks the word, needs the word. We all do. Now, with this fear and trembling, this reverence for God, this dependency upon him, we see that God is the agent of this. Notice how it continues he says, for it's God who works in you to will and to act according to his good pleasure. You go work out your salvation, but no, God's on top working in you to will and to do. 
what? Yep. You really want it some other way? I'll go work it out. You stay away, Lord. You, you butt out. And I'll, it, uh, I'll solve it. Really? No, you, you work out your salvation because God's grace is all over you. <laughs> His mercy is crawling in you and through you and helping you. It's according to his will, his acting, because he works in you to will and to act. Canons of Dort talk about that. How does someone come to conversion? There's really strong language uh, in that connection under heads three, four. It, it talks about how the spirit indwells us in such a way that he takes an unwilling will and makes it willing. And he, and he takes a, a hard, stony, non-compliant heart and, he, and he, he turns it and makes it compliant. So that, yeah, we're really doing willing. We're really doing the wanting, the desiring. But in back of that is God has been doing a work in us and for us to change us. You know, it's like the sinner in Mark 9. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Yeah, I do believe, but I'm weak. Lord, work in me. Help me. Act in me to will and to do according to your good pleasure. And his good pleasure is believe in Jesus. His good pleasure is repent and depend upon. His good pleasure is is for you, even on your deathbed. It's not what I've done. It's what Jesus has done for me. Peace, mercy, amen, praise God. Glory to him. So he's the agent at work. He's the agent at work to heal a wayward life. He's the agent at work, and that's why Jesus says his branches cannot bear fruit in themselves unless they abide in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. No fruitfulness saying adios to Jesus. I can do it on my own now. Not at all. None of us can do it on our own. We need God. So even, you can even ask yourself, how did you ever come to faith? How did you get saved? Well, well, God saved me. God did the saving. That's right. God did the saving. Uh, did, did, did you do something so you can congratulate yourself? I deserve it more. Well, you know, even if you did and lived a better life than other people, at least outwardly, if not inwardly, isn't that God's grace too? What do you have that you didn't receive, says Paul, and since you received it, no boasting. It's all grace. Grace alone, Christ alone, faith alone. He brings you to this confession of your sin and he hangs on to us. Forget what's behind, I press on, because Christ has taken hold of me. Yeah, I take hold of him, but he takes hold of me. This is wonderful good news for all of us. It's what we all need. We know that song from the blue psalter, My Lord, I did not choose thee, for that could never be. My heart would still refuse thee had you not chosen me. You took the sin that stained me, you cleansed me, made me new. I know that if I love thee, you must have loved me first. I amen to that. In John 5, you have that cripple, unable to walk. And at the word of Jesus, he gets up, picks up his mat and starts walking. He walks because of the working of God in him. We repent and believe and continue to work out our salvation 
because of the working of God in us to will and to do. There's a prayer. Lord, work in me to will and to do your will. Thy will be done. Work in me to will and to do your will. And then lastly here, we are to do this not only with fear and trembling, we're also to do it, this working out of our salvation, without, now with fear and trembling, without complaining and arguing. <laughs> My dad once said to me, eh, our family is an arguing family. <laughs> it's a trait. It's a family trait, he said. And he has an arguing family. <laughs> I was like, well, this is not very good news. <laughs> you know? It's a family trait. I mean, it, Life is hard enough, but when you make it into a trait, no, oh, wow. <laughs> and it was his side of the family, not my mother's side of the family that he claimed was, uh, they're arguers. And I was going, well, I don't want that, you know. Is it on me? <laughs> Get it off, you know. Well, it's ready enough in the church. What do we read in verses 14? And following, do everything without complaining or arguing. And there's a lot of stuff to do in the church. Church always needs volunteers, always needs leaders, always needs servants. And there's everything to be done, but everything that needs to be done needs to be done without complaining or arguing. So that you may, it says, become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. Even Jesus referred to the generation in which he labored as adulterous and unbelieving and hard of heart. The Old Testament prophets often will refer to a whole generation of people they're seeking to bring the God to as hard-hearted and stiff-necked, difficult. And we even see in our own times, and some of you have lived life longer than I have, and you can remember a kind of united commitment to something that once held sway, and then another generation comes along and it sort of falls away. Not every generation is, is faithful as the one before that follows. Well, here... Paul's talking about the kind of generation of a depraved world. And we well know a depraved world in our times. It says that we are to become blameless and pure. And I've been kind of struck by that, talking to younger seminarians who maybe feel the pinch of a hostile secularism. I think in America we lived with a what I'll call a gentle secularism for a long time, where, you know, the leave it to beaver generation, the post-World War II generation, will kind of get our arms around religion politely for a while. But yeah, we don't, we, we're not bowing to Jesus. We're not living for him. We want to make money and, you know, have fun, do our thing. But our culture, then came the Vietnam generation and then some of their children. And currently we have those, what's this Christian stuff? Never heard of it. Hate it. Can't we get rid of it? A hostile secularism. You know, it, it's not out of nowhere. There's been a, a gross secularism in our society for a really long time. But now it's more overt, more hostile has its fists up. We need to be blameless and pure, not compromised and sort of just like the world except we go to church and pray. We have to really live distinctly. That's what I hear Paul saying here. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. And he likens it to shining like stars in the sky. Now, you only see stars at night. So the world is the black sky. 
And without stars, you wouldn't see anything. There's nothing. There's no lighting up at all. But with the stars, there is some light given. And what do you notice up in the night sky? The stars. That's supposed to be us in this world. Driving to church tonight, I was struck by the hustle and bustle. Right? You're on 394, everyone's driving like mad. You have to drive like mad with the mad drivers. You always have to do that exit into South Holland that's, you know, <laughs> threading the needle. This car's getting off, you're trying to get, or getting on. And, and, all the, and then you drive down, what is it, 159th in South Holland, and all the hustle and bustle. No thought of God, no worship, no concern living their life like dumb mules, not knowing their right hand from their left. It's sad, and it's not just South Hall, and it's all over, right? Everywhere across America. It's everywhere. We're to be stars in this dark universe. And it says in verse 16, as you hold out the word of life, now, other translations, in fact, the NIV has a little note there, or hold on to the word of life. Is the verb there, you can translate it, I'm holding on to the word of life. I'm studying it. I'm imbibing it. I'm, I'm guarding it. I'm, or it can mean I'm holding it out. I'm sharing it. I'm dispersing it. Which? Both. Both. I hold on to hold forth. I imbibe in order to uh, send forth. I grow in the word in order that I have knowledge to bring forth the word. They're both true at the same time. As you hold out and hold forth the word of life in order that I may boast that he, Paul, may boast on the day of Christ. That's when he returns in the flesh that I may boast on the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. In other words, I want you Philippian believers and now believers across this world, the believers that's us here, I want you to shine like stars, be blameless without fault, live pure lives, guard your heart, shine like stars in the heavens of a night sky. And then Paul can say about the Philippians, Oh, Lord, look at the fruits of your grace. My labor wasn't in vain. There's fruitfulness here. That's what every pastor wants, every elder wants. Every church member wants their church to be fruitful. And the fruitfulness here is that we're shining as stars. We're holding out and holding forth and holding to the word of life. And God sees, and God blesses, and God knows. And then verse 17, and even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice, because he's in prison, and death looms on the horizon, even if I should die and be executed for my faith, that's fine. I'm glad. I rejoice. I, 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 I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm glad and rejoice with all of you because of the service coming from your faith. I see fruits. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Well, there's some marching orders. Here's a way to live. We're in a new year. Rather than be slumped in our faith, let's straighten our back, let's lift our head, let's square our shoulders. Let's say onward march, the world's big, we're small, unbelief's powerful, faith struggles, but the Lord is the Lord. Believe it. And his, he has his eye on every child of his. He knows every church and every circumstance. He knows every church and every struggle across this globe, in this community as well. And through his word, he's telling us, hey, 
work out your salvation. Let's get busy with the daily salvation workout that builds faith, that lives faith, and has fruits of faith. Sounds good to me, doesn't it? It's God's word after all. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness and mercy. Thank you for the call to live out our faith, not to simply hide it under a bushel, but no, to let it be light to the world, to light up a room, and to hold it forth to the nations that so much need it. Lord, grant us this, and may we be united in our mind and our service here in this place that you give to us. Hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen.